much for chatting this time, Yetta. We have uh, IQ Arasuli on the uh, the line with us, uh, calling in from uh, Europe. IQ is the foremost expert in the world today on Islam, understands the religion better than anyone, uh, and has written a, a series of books called Lifting the Veil, the Two Faces of Muhammad uh, and uh, Islam, uh, all of which are available through uh, Amazon. IQ... Uh, Back in 2007, it's just now getting attention, a group of Islamic scholars wrote a a document to invite Christians to reconcile their great religions together. Can I share with you the introduction to this and get your um, feedback? Please do. On October 13, 2007, on the occasion of Eid al-Fatar, the fast of following Ramadan, the Muslim holy month of fasting. Oh, by the way, how is it a fast when you can uh, eat all you want to uh, after the sun goes down? Not only this, huh? they kill each other during this fasting. Yeah, that's the, the holy month of jihad, isn't it? Of course, Ramadan is jihad. Yeah, Ramadan is the celebration of jihad. 138 Muslim scholars. Uh, the next thing I would say, it, doesn't the term scholar imply some degree of knowledge? Absolutely, but in Islam there is no such thing. That's, That's right. That's right. So there really isn't. Uh, I mean, Muslim scholars are an oxymoron. Thank you very much. You said it. Yeah. yeah, it's the dumbest religion ever ever conceived, with the most stupid book ever written. I mean, it, I don't know how you could describe the Quran other than to say it is easily the worst book ever written. By any That's how I describe it also. Yeah. You know, so to be an, a Muslim scholar and you're not intelligent enough to realize that the Quran is, uh, is a jumbled mess, that it has no context and no chronology. Have you ever read a book that was considered sane, that had no context and no chronology? But the Quran, the Quran does not, it's not presented in chronological order, and it has absolutely no topical context, does it? No, there is no uh, linearity, there is no sequence of events, there is no beginning, there is no middle, there is no ending, none. No, and that's, that's speaking of chronological uh, time, but there's also no, let's go from one, uh, one thing, like let's go from creation to covenant to, uh, to exodus to invitations. Uh, no, there's not, there's not even a walking through of topics. Well, it can't be since the first revelation, which would have been the first verse of the first chapter, is relegated to the 96th. Correct. And the last two revelations, according to Muhammad, chapters five and chapters nine, are in the beginning, not at the end. Right. So we got we have a jumbled mess. And you, would, if you claim to be a scholar, you would have to know that the Quran has some thirty different creation accounts, and they're all contradictory, and none of them are are truthful. Correct, but they are scholars of the Quran. They are scholars of the Quran. It doesn't make them scholars of knowledge. <laughs> That's the oxymoron. Okay. Anyway, they claim to be uh, Muslim scholars of every corner of uh, the Muslim world, representing every uh, major school of Islamic thought, uh, e.g. Sunni, Shia, S- Sufi, etc. Um, how many Sufis are there in the world today uh, by percentage of uh, Muslims? Maybe 0.1%. Yeah. So why would you even mention Sufi? For you to mention Sufi is to say, I haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. But they haven't got a clue what they're talking about. And by the way, is there a unified uh, uh, school of thought among the Sunnis, or are there many different Sunni schools of thought? There are four. The major ones are four. Right. And the Sunnis contradict the Shia. Right. And the Shia and the Sunnis contradict the, the, the other sects of Islam. Right. Like Ismailis and Zaydis and the others. So really, there is no consensus whatsoever. Right. The only consensus there is is that the Quran is from Allah. But you and I know that Allah is not the same as the God of the Bible, no. and that Allah in fact is Muhammad. Yeah, so, Muhammad. Yeah, for sure. yeah, absolutely. So to, for someone to write this as if they, and this has been written by Yale, that uh, Sunni is a school of thought 
is to is to completely uh, misrepresent what Sunni Islam actually is. It's not a school of thought. And to say that they got scholars together from Sunni and Shia Islam as if they were of one accord when the greatest and most vicious war being fought today is Sunnis and Shias trying to uh, obliterate one another from the planet. Where Sunnis routinely say of Shias that they're apostates and must be killed, and Shias say of Sunnis that they're not Muslims and they must be killed. You could yes. never have an accord between a Sunni and a Shia Muslim. Correct. Never. But, the, but the accord, with all due respect, is in deceiving the Christians. Okay. That's what the accord uh, is. Okay. So, uh, the, the person writing this to give the, uh, in, the, the inference that there is a school of thought that is called Sunni Islam, and there isn't. There's four schools and in, uh, in four major schools in, uh, in uh, thought in Sunni Islam, uh, and uh, that that Shias and Sunnis are of one accord when they view each other as non-Muslims, and that Sufi is something that even represents Islam. I mean, all Sufi is is let's let's throw away 99.999% of what the Quran and Muhammad said and did. And let's uh, let's elevate the one one hundredth of one percent, uh, and uh, and extrapolate upon it. Is that a decent summation of what Sufi Islam is? <coughs> Goofy yes. spiritualism <laughs> without basis. By the way, they are considered as apostates anyway. By both Sunnis and uh, and Shias. Thank you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, sent an open letter to the leaders of Christian churches everywhere. This, note, this noteworthy group of Muslim scholars and clerics, now is, there's no such thing as a noteworthy group of Muslim scholars and clerics, maintains, uh, clerics certainly, uh, scholars know, the common ground between Muslims and Christians centers on the commands to love God and to love our neighbor. Uh, where does the Quran tell Muslims to love God? Uh, never, not once. Does the what is the name of the uh, God of the Quran? And don't just tell me Allah, because Allah was the third name given to the God of oh, the yes. Quran. You had Lord, you had Rab, and you had Rahman. Yes, yes. So Allah is just one of the uh, of the names of the God of the uh, the Quran. Are any of the names of the of the gods of the Quran and of Islam Yahweh? No, of course not. So. Uh, if you're, if you're, even if Islam said to love our Rahman, love the Lord, love uh, um, Allah, even if it did, then there would be no common ground on loving God because Yahweh and these false gods have nothing in common. Yes, the Bible says, God in the Bible says, uh, this is my name. This is my appellation. Right. Any other name is null and void. Right. Yeah. Any other name is a false god. And in fact, the first statement that he etched in stone says, "And if you're associating with a god by any other name, you have nothing in common with me." Correct. Yeah. And he says, so when he uses his name to uh, to Moshe, he says, "This is my one and only name, and the only name that I want to be remembered for all time." So you can't say uh, to love God if you don't know. Who it is that you're speaking of, and the and the, but it's worse than that, isn't it? IQ, isn't the depiction of Allah in the Quran someone who is a a um, a terrorist, someone who is a mass murderer, someone who spends a hundred percent of his time in hell, sadistically torturing people? Of course, that's Allah. Yeah, but that's that's exactly what Muhammad is. Of course. This is why all this torture, all this murder, mass murder, rape, and these are the facets of Muhammad. Right. Very cleverly, Muhammad is a ventriloquist, mm -hmm. putting the word into the mouth of a God called Allah, and that Allah used to be the name of the supreme rock god of pagan Arabia of 360 gods and goddesses. Yeah. In fact, Yosha said that you know the most important statement in the uh, in the Torah. It's found in the body him, and it's to uh, love Yahweh, your God. Correct. Uh, and so that is, it's an essential part of the uh, of the Torah prophets, where Yahweh says that He wants to have the, play the role of Father, and He wants us to uh, to love Him. 
He wants us to come to know him, and he wants us to love him, which means he cannot be feared, which is why he says the fear of God is a, is a human tradition taught by religious individuals. Uh, but I want to reemphasize this again. Does the Quran ever once, ever once, tell Muslims that they should love Allah? Never. Never. Not once. So for them to Only say that the love of God... Allah. Wait, wait, wait. With all yeah. due respect, I want them to know. Submit to Allah. Correct. Submit, that means a slave of Allah. Right. And there is no love between me. a slave and the Lord. Never. That is Never. Ever. Yes. So you are correct. Now... Would it even be possible that we, we understand that the Quran never tells Muslims to love God, so you can't have a common ground between Christianity and Islam based upon love of God because there isn't a single reference in the Quran which can even be remotely interpreted as loving Allah. But beyond that... Love doesn't exist in the Quran in the manner that we use in the Bible. No. Never. Never. No, no, and it's never even in any inference directed at between man and, and uh and Allah. Uh, By the way, yes. there's even no reference between love between man and man in the Quran. <laughs> wow, so the second part of this doesn't exist either, which is love your fellow man. Neither of those two statements are ever made uh, in the Quran, ever. No. No. Okay, now, um, since I equate the Hadith to the Quran, because the Quran is Hadith, um, does the Hadith anywhere, does Muhammad in his Hadith, Tell uh, Muslims to love Allah. No, only to fear him and to submit. Always okay. fear, always terror. Right. Nothing to do with love. Nothing right. to do with affection. Right. You're correct. Uh, in fact, does, doesn't the Quran say that Allah is unknowable? Yes. Is it possible for you to love someone that you do not know? No. Okay. Only in the figment of imagination. Okay. Now... Um, in the Quran, the, um, Allah's behaviors and his uh, locale are presented quite often. Where is, and we've already hinted at this, but where is Allah always presented? Where, what's his locale? Hell. A hundred percent of the time, isn't it? Hell. Yeah. Okay. And what is Allah doing in hell? Watching or torturing his own creation that he literally predestined to destruction. So, is that kind of a, let's pretend, a wannabe deity? Is that kind of individual lovable under any twisted version of love? Ever? Yes, only under the twisted version of Islam. Only. <laughs> We'll return in a moment. IQ. This article, uh, actually it's a uh, position paper written uh, by Yale University on behalf of a common word. It says that um, the common scholarly and clerical approach by Muslims to find common ground between Muslims and Christians centers on the command to love God and to love our neighbor. Is is it possible for me to command you to love me? No. Well, it is possible, but that doesn't mean I have to follow it. Well, well I, I guess I can command you to love me, but can love be compelled? No. Doesn't love require That's a choice? Right, That's it's a contradiction. contradiction. Right. Love absolutely requires free will. Correct. A, a person has to choose to love. Absolutely. Okay, so it is this notion that, that would resonate with Christians because they, they believe that there are commandments. There are the, you know what's called the Ten Commandments? There's not one of them that's even written in the, as a command. There's only one that's actually in the imperative mood, and the imperative mood in Hebrew actually conveys volition. All of them are written in volitional moods. Uh, so there is not a command among them. Uh, there are ten statements. The Hebrew word is debar. It means statement, word. Uh, and so this notion that Christians have and that Muslims have that, that God can, can command us to love him is an oxymoron. It's impossible. God does not have to order us to love him. That is correct. He's, He's the creator. He doesn't right. need our love. Well, he actually wants our love. Uh, he doesn't need yes, anything, but he, but he, but he, he, but he wants it. it. No, he's, 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 he's too smart to command something that cannot be compelled. Now, right. okay, beyond uh, that, 
if we, uh, we say that it's the command to love God and our neighbor, which you've affirmed, is there isn't a single reference in the Quran or the Hadith anywhere that tells Muslims to love God or that tells Muslims or orders Muslims to love their fellow man? Never. Never. Okay. Now, uh, this goes on to say, Proposing this as a basis for dialogue. Now, how can you propose this as a basis for dialogue when it does not exist in Islam? It's but just Yale a, University, as you know, is a very intelligent university. Mm -hmm. It's yes. so left-wing, it right. doesn't know what the hell it's talking about. Ah, no, I think they do. I think they do. Oh. Okay, let me tell you what I think they, they know. I think that, the, that political correctness, which is the dominant replacement moral code, in academia worldwide, outside of the uh, Islamic world, of course, but in the West, in Europe, in the United States. Political correctness is the replacement moral code uh, for universities. And po what political correctness would say is that the lie that is consistent with the belief systems of socialist secular humanism is correct. It is correct to deceive so long as the deception is consistent with our belief system. The truth is unacceptable. Yes. So political correctness is about presenting lies. So from their perspective, the fact that they're presenting a total and complete uh, distortion of Islam, they would view that as, uh, as being politically correct. Agreed. I'm not going to argue about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So proposing this is the basis of dialogue, they invite Christians, leaders from around the world, to engage with them in a discussion that, importance, uh, that supports the important work of reconciliations between these two great religious communities. How are you going to reconcile pe uh, two religions when they are the antithesis of one another? Well, what I can't understand is, why hasn't Yale looked at any of the chapters, the first nine chapters of the Quran, to come to the, any conclusion other, which is, would have been the opposite of what they're talking about? Correct. Ma ma may I quote some verses? Please. I mean, take a simple example. Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 51, says, O oh, ye who believe Muslims, take not the Jews, Yahud, in Arabic, and the Christians, Nasara, in Arabic, for your friends are protectors, they are but friends and protectors to each other. Mm -hmm. And he amongst you Muslims that turn to them for friendship is of them. Ladies and gentlemen, the implication of the last sentence is of immense importance, as I repeat it. And he amongst you Muslims that turn to them, Jews and Christians, for friendship is of the means that any followers of Muhammad who befriend or are under the rule of Christians or Jews or any non-Muslim group, would be considered apostates to Islam, enemies of Islam, outsiders to Islam who must be slaughtered. In a nutshell, right. ladies and gentlemen, no Muslim in America or Europe or any non-Muslim state can ever be loyal to the Constitution of the United States of America because it's not man-made, because it is man-made, not from Allah Sharia. Right. Nor can any Muslim, according to this verse, be a loyal citizen to any non-Muslim American because non-Muslim Americans are called infidels, kuffar, unbelievers, kafirun, to be either converted, subjugated, or exterminated. So the Quran says you can't even befriend a Christian. So a Muslim cannot even befriend a Christian without being considered by Allah an apostate. And doesn't the Quran say that Allah is going to torture the former Muslims in hell? Of course. Yale University went on to write... This invitation refer, referred to as a common word between us and you. So what are they inferring here is the common word? To tell you the truth, I'm at a loss. What is the common word? Oh, they claim it's love. <laughs> love God, it's it. love God, love your neighbor. That they, uh, that's the common word. Where, uh, where, do, we, where do we find the, the word love in the Quran? Nowhere. So how is it a common word if it is a if it's wholly excluded from uh, one of the uh, of the two religions? Well, it just shows how, as you said, politically correct Yale is. Yeah, it's, which means no brains. Right. Common means that they they have they both have that word as something that's important to and central to their doctrine, and yet in Islam the word does not exist. That, that means you, you can't have commonality. That's the, uh, they would be the inverse of one another. 
This invitation, so it goes on to say, a common word is viewed by many as the most important interfaith document in nearly a half century. It's important. How, how could you be so full of yourself that you would say this is the most important interfaith document when it's based on a overt lie, a complete deception? But this is Islam. What did Muhammad say? Lie. 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 The greatest deceiver in the world is Allah. Right. Oh, yeah, the Quran says that Allah is the, is the greatest of deceivers. No, by the way, why would you, why would you believe a God uh, who's, who in the midst of his recital tells you that he is the best of all deceivers? And by the way, I he is. I have no idea. I wouldn't, but Muslims do one and a half billion of you. Yeah. yeah, by the way, he is, because uh, Allah was modeled after Satan, and Satan is a great deceiver. Yeah. Yeah. Satan is probably the greatest of deceivers, and Allah was modeled after Satan. It's one of the many statements in the Quran that's true. There are statements in the Quran that are true. That just happens to be one of them, that Allah is the, uh, the greatest uh, deceiver. Uh, but nonetheless, you shouldn't, uh, in your right mind, uh, believe them. So this is an opportunity to have substantive uh, dialogue with leading Muslims and Christians. How can you have meaningful dialogue if the, if the common word doesn't exist in one of the two languages? You can't, but there is something else missing. Okay. In chapter 4, al Nisa. Mm -hmm. Verse 155, 157. Okay. The Quran says, They said, We killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them, and for a certainty, they killed him not. So, in one verse, mm -hmm. in chapter 5, 4, verse 157, the Quran denies the death and resurrection of Jesus and at one instant eliminating the whole of Christianity. Yeah. So what is the commonality? Yeah. We could, of course, spend uh, hours talking about what actually occurred on uh, Passover in 33 CE, but yeah. your point remains valid that the, that the Christian faith, the Christian religion, is based right. upon this, this idiotic notion that their uh, God died and that your, their God was bodily resurrected. And what, uh, what the Quran says is that the basis of Christianity is completely bogus. Thank you. Yes. So now, what is by the, the commonality by the way, yeah. between the belief or system of Islam and Christianity? None. Zero. None. In no. belief, zero. No. Absolutely, absolutely not. I was just, just out of curiosity. Uh, do you think that God can die? Well, according to the definition of people who believe that. Yes. No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm asking you a question. You're, you're, no, you're a thoughtful individual. The whole definition of God is immortal. Correct. Forever, so right. right. all knowing, right. all right. powerful. Right. In fact, when uh, Yahweh is providing a prophecy about uh, Paul and Christianity, uh, the author of the, uh, of the uh, prophecy, the man that is, that is writing down what God says, interjects his own uh, uh, comments along the way because he's being given a foresight as to what uh, Paul's going to write. And he says, come on, how can you be so stupid? God can't die. And so it's just make, making a mockery of the uh, of the whole thing. But uh, nonetheless, that is what Christians believe in. So the Quran is the antithesis of that. And does not the Quran tell uh, Muslims to wipe uh, the uh, the Christians and the Jews out to the last, to kill every last of one of them? Of course. Doesn't sound very I loving mean, to me. They every single sermon in every single mosque every single Friday. Right. So this says, for this reason, the reconciliation program at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, along with other members of the Yale Divinity School community, have responded with the publication Loving God and Neighbor Together, a Christian response to a common word between us and you, henceforth known as the Yale response. And the Yale response was released several days after a common word was published in a full-page advertisement in the New York Times with the signature of 130 prominent Christian leaders and scholars. Well, they can't be, they can't be scholars, that's for sure. They, they might be Christian leaders, but they're perverted type of Christian leaders. Well, you know, the fact is that Christianity is, like all religions, is, is based on a, on a pile of lies. Uh, and what's happening here is that, the, that those who make a living promoting religion want 
don't want anyone to question any religion, but they want everyone to look at all religions as, uh, as noble, as good, as credible. Otherwise, they lose their ability to deceive. And so they don't want a kink in any religion because it undermines their religion. True. Yeah, so that's what's, uh, what's happening here. Now, this goes on to say, does the Quran really emphasize love as strongly as the Bible does? Is the description of Islam in the common word letter accurate? So, <laughs> no, the answer is no. Now, you, you won't believe how, how ridiculous their answer is. It is true that many Christians would interpret Islam would not interpret Islam as it is described in a common word. Rather than just tell us the truth, no, love is never mentioned in the Quran. Uh, there is no in Quranic instruction to love your neighbor or to love God. This is an absolute lie. They say that many Christians would not interpret the Quran this way. Can you imagine how disingenuous these buffoons are? But they're continuing to do it as we speak today. Yes. Every newspaper, every TV station, every leader that we have right, in the West right. are doing yeah. exactly the same thing. Right. They're, they're using this argument. Many Christians would not see love as being the heart of the message of the Quran. Rather than just tell us the truth. Which is that, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to say, well, the Christians are kind of naive in this regard. Rather than tell us the truth. That love is not only not a a central theme of the Quran, it doesn't even exist in the Quran. They now, can't you, tell you that. But well, they can't tell you that. You to me. They, can't. Right. they can't say that because if they said that, they would be completely undermining their entire project, and rather than being the most important in 50 years, it becomes nothing but another on the long list of academic deceptions. Absolutely. Academic and religious deception. Yes. And, and, and both are extraordinarily common. But if Muslim leaders of the world determine publicly, now so they're not saying that the Christians are wrong and not saying that love in the Quran even because it doesn't exist. So what they're doing now is saying, aha, we're going to really fool you here. We're going to mention Quran here and think, okay, so uh, we're, we're talking about the Quran and Islam, but then they transition. If, but if Muslim leaders... If Muslim leaders of the world publicly situate love at the center of their faith as the touchstone of a true religion and, and to initiate dialogue on that basis, then surely Christians should welcome that move. So they're saying that here, I mean, I'm sure you're following this, that, okay, so love really isn't in the Quran. But what if we get imams to pretend that love is central to their religion. Wouldn't that be good? No. <laughs> because that's a pretense. That's not fact. Right. And uh, by the way, oh, how long would an imam live if he was telling Muslims that loving Christians and loving infidels and loving uh, uh, Muslims of a different persuasion is central to uh, the Quranic story? How long would that imam live? One microsecond. Yes. And who's going to kill him? His own congregants. Yeah, that's correct. And so, does, does the Quran give, did Muhammad give, does Allah, should he exist, give Muslims the ability to interpret the Quran differently in different circumstances, to change it, to evolve, to grow? Does it ever give them that license? Not a chance. This is why, this is a remarkable thing what's happening in the 21st century. Christians are reinterpreting their books. The Supreme Court says, yes, you can be married, although it's not man and a woman, a woman. it can right. be man and man, a woman and a woman. Mm -hmm. They are reinterpreting, but Islam has stuck to the gun. They never changed an iota of the Quran. And anybody who tries to change an iota of the Quran, even one dot, is exterminated. Yes. What I said uh, about a number of years ago is that Islam is going through a reformation. You know, the, uh, the Daniel Pipes of the world and, and others were uh, encouraging an Islamic reformation. And I kept on saying, well, if you have an Islamic reformation, if the religion is reformed on its basis, which would be to reform it on its basis, then every Muslim is going to be a jihadist, that the entire world will be at war. And, and 
and that every Muslim will be a fundamentalist, therefore every Muslim will be a jihadist. And I said, so that's the worst thing that could possibly happen, but I, I uh, proposed my conclusion, which was, it is happening. It is. ISIS is the reformation. Correct. ISIS is literally the, yeah. the soul of reformation of Islam. That literally. is correct. That is correct. That's why it's so popular in the Islamic world, is there are a lot of young people that are pulled to the heartstrings of the religion, uh, to the, the very core, to the fundamentals of the religion. And so the, the, the reality is that Islam, rather than reinventing itself, is reforming itself. Yes, it's going back to its roots. Right. Absolutely to its roots, to the way Muhammad was 1,400 years ago in Mecca and Medina. Which a means... Murderer, a murderer, right. a child rapist, mm -hmm. a slave owner, uh, you name a negative adjective, that was Muhammad. There is not a single Muslim in the world that's going to believe any Muslim cleric that tries to reshape Islam. And that's what they're admitting here. That there is no love of God or fellow man anywhere in the Quran or Hadith. But what if, but what if we get uh, Islamic clerics here and there to pretend that there is and to try to change the religion and to alter it from its roots? All it's at a time. Done. It can't be done. And, be it, done. and it's all at a time that Islam is reforming on its roots, which is why we see the rise of the Islamic State and Islamic terrorism. The next statement here is that this says uh, that your uh, chief duty, uh, so it's if Muslims say to, uh, to their fellow Muslims, so if Muslims' leaders say to fellow Muslims that your chief duty toward Christians is to love them, and that freedom of religion is a central part of that love. Wouldn't they be contradicting the Quran? Does, the, doesn't the Quran say that, that Allah has chosen your religion and you have absolutely no freedom in that regard? That's exactly what the Quran says. Yes. Doesn't the Quran tell Muslims that they must hunt down, lay in wait for, use all weapons at their disposal to ambush and terrorize Christians? Yes. Christian, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, anybody who was a Muslim. That's 80% of currently humanity. Or anybody that, that is a non-jihadist Muslim. So, Absolutely also. So this whole, this, this whole argument is completely specious. And then, then it goes on to say, why aren't Jews included in this dialogue? Oh, and it says, oh, they are. A common letter was specifically addressed to the leaders of Christian churches everywhere. <laughs> in order to address the concrete issues and the problems between Muslims and Christians. And, and so how is that? So if it's written to Christians from Muslims, how are Jews included? I have no idea. Then it goes on to say that it's appropriate uh, for, uh, for Yale to emphasize in the, uh, the very opening of this that the loving God and neighbor lies at the heart of the most ancient Abrahamic faith Judaism. Did Abraham have a religion? No. No. Did Abraham actually know Yahweh? No. Oh, yeah, he did. Abraham actually knew did. Yahweh. No, Abraham walked with Yahweh. He ate with Yahweh. He conversed with Yahweh. Yeah, did he walked with, with Yahweh. Oh, absolutely. Oh, oh absolutely. Oh, yeah. The, Yahweh uses his name throughout the, the covenant discussions with uh, Abraham. And so the um, situation with Abraham, where, where Yahweh was even performing miracles, you know, his wife is laughing at the notion that he's going to have a son named uh, uh, a son, uh, because, you know, she is 90 and he is 80, he's 100. And they're saying, you know, they're, they're laughing at God, saying you're going you're gonna to have a son. And God laughs right around with him. He says, oh, well, guess what? We're going to name the son Yishak, Isaac, which means laughter in Hebrew. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's performing. In fact, when Abraham said, hey, listen, God, before he had the son, he says, I don't get, you, you're telling me that I'm going to inherit this covenant and, and I'm going to get this wonderful inheritance in the covenant and I don't even have a kid. Why is an inheritance good for me when I'm 100 years old? And Yahweh took him to heaven, took him to the stars, showed him light and said, you know, this is what you're inheriting. You're going to become like light, empowered, uh, immortal. And, uh, and, uh, do you think that after God takes you and shows you what you're going to be transformed into, takes you to heaven, 
creates a son for you that you're going to say, you know, I have faith? Or are you going to say, hey, I know you. I rather like you. He didn't have a religion. He didn't have any faith. He knew God. And so how in the world is Judaism an Abrahamic faith? I have no idea. I mean, I, I just don't get it. Why, why do people think that Islam is an Abrahamic faith? Is the Islamic Quranic depiction of Abraham, does it have even a shred of credibility? None. But there was no relationship between Arabs and Abraham. Never. There was never, never any relationship. There was never a mention of Abraham prior to Muhammad right. in the whole of the history right. of the Arabs. Right. And the only reason Muhammad mentions him is that the only passages in the Quran that even have a semblance of credibility are the ones that he bought from rabbis and then twisted to his own accord. So he took their stories of Abraham and twisted them to serve his interest. Absolutely. So if, if I were to take a story of, uh, of Alexander the Great, and I were to say that Alexander the Great was a, a great Egyptian uh, god, and that Alexander the Great founded the Babylonian religion. Uh, would, would you just laugh at me? Out of the city, out of the country, out of everywhere. You're right. And isn't that what Muhammad does with Abraham? Absolutely. There's no relationship. Right. He, he has Abraham in Mecca, for crying out loud. Did Abraham go to Mecca? No, yeah, not only in Mecca. He built the foundations of the Kaaba. Right. Yes. And so his depiction of Abraham is so ludicrous, so ridiculous. All he did is he listened to stories told to him by rabbis that he bought to make his crown, Quran seem credible when he ran out of pagan Hadith stories, Hanif stories, and he got them all convoluted and twisted. Islam is not an Abrahamic faith. In fact, there is none. 